Dr. Trask, Sala, and Huntington to discuss the role of COVID and its impact on families. It uh, promises to be a really wonderful event. And then at 10.30 tomorrow is the excellent event from Renata Kazmarska, who is the focal point on the family at the United Nations. And that event is titled Families in Development, Copenhagen and Beijing uh, plus 25, so 25 years later. Um, and so now for our event, uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce uh, Stephen Smoot uh, to talk to us today on the topic demographics and the family, conditions for family and societal flourishing. Uh, Stephen is an author and a documentarian. He's the president of Excel Investment Corporation and a founder and president of the Family First Foundation. He is the producer and executive producer of four really uh, nice documentaries on topics that he'll be talking about today. Uh, the Demographic Winter, The Decline of the Human Family, Demographic Bomb, Demography is Destiny, The Lost Civilizations of North America, and Outcomes, Family, and Faith Factors. Oh, and then I apologize, New Economic Reality, Demographic Winter. Um, so uh, Stephen has been an invited speaker for the European Union, for World Congress of Families, and many more. He's also, also an author of the book, Lost American Antiquities, A Hidden History. Uh, so we're really looking forward to a wonderful event. Uh, the way we'll hold today's event, Stephen will give a presentation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have question and answer uh, that I'll moderate for the group. So with no further ado, Stephen, take it over. We really look forward uh, to hearing your thoughts and to joining us today. Well, it's great to have the opportunity to share with you uh, this research that I prepared to share at the United Nations uh, CSW conference. Uh, scheduled there for, for New York, which was canceled like about every other major event around the world. Such cancellations may be effective in slowing uh, the spread of the coronavirus, yet it will do little to reverse the chilling effects of the coming demographic winter, an event uh, that the world, I believe, is not prepared for. In our research and production, as he mentioned, of four documentaries uh, on demographics, Demographic Winter, The Decline Human Family, Demographic Bomb, Demography as Destiny, and The New Economic Reality, Demographic Winter, and our recent uh, documentary that we've just produced called Outcomes of Family and Faith Factors, our production team uh, interviewed many scholars, demographers, economists, sociologists, and civic leaders from around the world who uh, who, who shared really re revealing uh, factual uh, in information. Uh, we call this new season of change a demographic winter. So what is demography? It is a study of the statistical data that makes up a population. Its size, its growth, its decline, its birth rates, the age and gender makeup of a population, uh, et cetera. So does the demographics of a country really matter? In 2011, uh, I was in New York attending the United Nations Commission on Social Development and to give an introduction screening at the UN Millennial Plaza of our latest documentary, The New Economic Reality Demographic Winter. It was a beautiful morning in March as I was walking to the UN Plaza. Uh, the sun rays was just starting to peak around these giant buildings of Manhattan when I caught a glimpse of ships coming into the New York Har Harbor wondering if my European ancestors may have come through those same ports at a time in history when we understood the necessity of immigrants as needed for a country's continued growth and economic prosperity. In that film introduction, I shared the words of Phil Longman, a Washington DC demographer and author of the book, The Empty Cradle, who stated that demographics may be the greatest predictor of the fate and future of society in the 21st century. Now, many are not aware that one of the most ominous dramas of modern times is quietly unfolding. As the world is headed towards a demographic tipping point, which really threatens serious social and economic consequences. The world today has experienced a 50% decline in birth rates over the last 50 years, uh, leaving over 70 countries around the world that will not replace the previous generation. If a country is to replace its, the previous generation, it takes a birth rate of 2.1 children 
to replace every two individuals. And all of Europe, for example, is only at 1.38. If a country's birth rate declines to 1.1, it puts the country in jeopardy of free fall, which is almost impossible to get turned around. The United Nations Population Division estimates that by, the 20, by 2050, that there will actually be 248 million fewer children under the age of five than there are at present. Now, in our interview with Dr. Gary Becker, recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, he stated that population reduction enters us into unknown terrain. Adam Smith, the greatest economist, stated that economic prosperity comes from population growth. And depression is associated with declining populations. This could lead to very serious consequences. Now, in 2005, uh, in the production of our first documentary, Demographic Winter of the Decline of the Human Family, we interviewed a German demographer who informed us that in Germany that very year, that the government had to close 280 schools because there were not enough children coming up through the ranks. Wondering how they were going to man their farms and their factories in the future. They understood then that due to the aging population and low birth rates that they were experiencing, that they would be experiencing a major labor shortage, which would mean a loss of government revenues and a loss of uh, human capital is really needed to be a prosperous state. They understood that if they wanted to grow uh, their workforce, they would have to really consider opening the borders to all comers, in which they did. Uh, as you know, Germany took in approximately 2 million Syrians as needed to keep their industries uh, operating. In uh, this video clip, uh, in which we interviewed both uh, Nicholas Eberstadt, uh, a Harvard economist, and uh, Dr. Gary Becker, uh, the Nobel Pr Prize winning economist. Uh, they both talked about human capital and the importance that human capital is for a, for a country. So I'm gonna just share with you this little uh, clip from uh, that Why is documentary. Why important for economists? Growth in an economy is based on a productivity advantage, which is the engine, fundamentally the engine of growth in any time. If human capital growth is essential for modern economic growth, how is human capital impacted by fertility decline? Well, it's hard to sustain economic growth without human capital increases. And so you can increase human capital either by getting everybody way, way educated and improving each person's productive capacity, or you can have more people. Um, there's really only two ways to do it. The way we measure economic progress is through what we call the gross domestic product. Now, many people don't realize that when the gross domestic product grows, most of that growth is population growth. growth economists define gross domestic product as the number of people, workers specifically, times their productivity. Current demographic trends in all rich countries mean that GDP growth won't come anymore from a growing number of workers. For example, the number of U.S. workers is projected to be stagnant for at least the next two decades. And Europe has an even worse problem with its working age population. Some replacement fertility a generation or more ago means that the working age population, 15 to 64, is going to be slowing and peaking and then declining more or less indefinitely as far as the demographers I can see. So if the working age population is shrinking, how can we increase in capital? Well, if you have fewer and fewer workers, each one of them has to get that much more productive in order to even keep the economy from shrinking, right? So in the context of flat or falling population, we have a much greater challenge just to keep the current standard of living what it is. Um, that's not controversial at all. That's just economics 101. Without more people, productivity increases and economic increases can only come from our working either harder 
we're smarter. Is this a problem? What we in the West have been doing is putting all of our eggs in the human capital basket and saying we're going to in increase the productivity of each person and letting the expansion of population part just go down the tubes and not even pay any attention to it. Well, we've come to the end of the road on that. We can't keep going down that particular path. So is population growth needed to keep a, a country on the path to economic prosperity. Uh, there is uh, a social and economic cost to a country with low birth rates and an aging population. The first is population decline, uh, which threatens a, a country's economic growth, placing a country in a cycle of regression. regression. Uh, this uh, cycle of regression will lead to uh, less government revenues, it will lead to higher taxes, will lead to less innovation, to a higher late el elderly cost, to be able to take care of their senior benefits, uh, creating more government deficits, and uh, this increase uh, in cost will get countries to have to really look at the importance of possibly opening their border to immigrants which oftentimes leads to government uh, instability and civil unrest. Dr. Joseph uh, Shami, director of the population division there at the United Nations, in a talk given to world leaders, he expressed concerns that it was the developed nations of the world that were experiencing the greatest decline in birth rates, stating that the developed world uh, depopulation would have an immediate negative impact on the global economy as developed countries have a particularly important role because they provide a great deal of the economic leadership. They are basically the producer, producer nations, the consumer nations, and the donor nations. These uh, two charts uh, show that huge declines uh, are taking place in both Europe and the Asian nations. Uh, as it relates to fertil fertility. One of the most uh, telling stories is that of Singapore. Singapore implemented a Dracosian two-child policy uh, decades ago, where the government dictated that the whole family would be punished if the family had a third child. The punishment would be a loss of social welfare benefits including uh, free education. So how did uh, this two-child policy work out for Singapore? Well, really not well, uh, given the fact that they have not been able to really figure out how to get this turned around. Uh, the data shows that in 1962, Singapore's birth rate was 5.21 uh, for every two individuals. Uh, but 20 years later, uh, in 1982, it dropped below, below replacement fertility at 1.74. And in 2017, it dropped to 1.16, which is 42% below uh, replacement fertility. In 1999, uh, on my flight back from the World Congress of Families II, uh, being held at the United Nations, Nations Assembly Hall there in Geneva, Switzerland, where I had just finished reading the book, uh, The Great Boom Ahead by Harry Dent, a Harvard economist and Bain Capital consultant, who claimed that through the study of demographics that his organ organization could predict the future prosperity of a country. Predicting in 1992 that the United States would continue an unprecedented economic growth due to the 81 million baby boom generation that was coming up through the economy then predicting a slowdown of the economy as these, this baby boom generation would enter their retirement years. Today, we are seeing an unprecedented economic shift take place. As the baby boom generation is uh, entering retirement, to uh, better understand uh, this history, uh, let's step back in time. I mean, after World War II, the American soldier returned home. 
and they started to produce babies, which, uh, in which they produced the largest generation of births in history. As this baby boom generation reached its peak spending years between 31 and uh, 50 years of age, the US uh, stock market soared, resulting in 40 and now going on 50 years of great prosperity. Harry Dant, uh, an investment advisor, pointed out that if you want to really grow your wealth, that you should invest in companies which catered to that 81 million baby boom generation that went through the, the economy in America. So what is happening in America today? There is an unprecedented uh, demographic shift. Uh, the baby boom generation found in America, okay, as they uh, enter retirement, okay, is going to change the whole landscape of the economic picture uh, going forward in, in America. Within five years, by the year 2025, the United States will see major demographic uh, shift to the point that there will be well over 65 million seniors over the age of 65 and only 58 million children under the age of 13. This is an econo not economic model that is not sustainable. Realizing that the ideal is to have 10 workers to support one person in retirement. Now on the marriage front, uh, the question can be asked is, marriage becoming obsolete. In 1960, 72% of all U.S. adults were married. By 2008, the figure dropped to 51%. Among those uh, 18 to 29 years of age, people in their prime childbearing years, 59 percent were married in 1960 compared to only 20 percent today. Few marriages uh, equal fewer children. So is the world prepared for this uh, demographic shift that's ta taken place? And uh, what far-reaching con uh, consequences are we going to realize? A good example of what happens when a country uh, stops having children is that of Japan. After World War II, Japan had all their women in the workforce for the war machine. After World War, uh, the World War, they encouraged the women to remain in the workforce, to clean up the ashes of destruction, and to help to uh, grow their economy. Thus, the Japanese didn't really have a baby boom generation like America had. However, their economy uh, did grow for a while during the 70s and 80s because they had everybody in the workforce, causing some economists to claim that maybe this is a model that America sh should consider. Forgetting, however, the important role that mothers play in the delivery and the development of a child as uh, needed really for, for a country's uh, growth. Now, uh, today, due to the lack of children, Japan, the country of uh, the rising sun, is now setting. Japan was one of the first countries in the world to experience a major birth dearth. After two uh, good decades, their dearth of children and their aging population has really weighed down their economy. Uh, to bolster their economy, uh, they were one of the first to really get into quantitative easing, which is the printing of money, which is not really a fix at all. Before uh, J Japan's government got heavily into quantitative easing in the 1950s uh, through 2005, uh, their market, uh, stock markets, lost 70% of its value and they saw real estate plummeting by 60%. Now, Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt of Harvard University pointed out that with low birth rates, uh, the reason why many of the nations have ex still experienced uh, a decline uh, or uh, continued growth is because the elderly population is just living a lot longer than ever before in history. 
For example, Japan's life expect expectancy in 2016 was 74.8 years of age. Now, the countries that are feeling some of the chill of this demographic winter are those countries that have the lowest uh, birth rates and rapidly aging populations. Uh, these are the same nations which uh, head the chart in the countries that have the highest amount of national debt as a measured as a percentage of their GDP. Japan's uh, national debt exceeded 230 times their GDP as compared to Greece, which was 177 times their GDP. Uh, and we know kind of what happened to uh, Greece as there was some run on the banks uh, when they were uh, starting to experience, you know, the, the pinch in their economy. And uh, how Germany and the European Union had to really come in and step in uh, to help rescue them. In March of 2019, while uh, in Verona, Italy, attending uh, the World Congress of Families 13, uh, where we had hundreds of delegates that came together from 45 different countries, uh, at this World Congress of uh, Families, I was asked to speak on this chilling effect that the uh, demographic winter was having on countries worldwide. Following my speech, a lady approached me. She introduced herself as the president of the Institute of European Studies. Uh, she told me that after being granted permission that she, they had taken taken our documentary Demographic Winter and uh, tr had it translated uh, in over 60 different languages, stating that Demographic Winter was now uh, well uh, known in Europe. In fact, she mentioned to me that the Pope had even uh, commented on it in a speech given. So I went to the internet and did the search to see uh, what I could find uh, about uh, demographic winter. And sure enough, it was a world news headline, which stated the Pope warns of a deepening demographic winter. Uh, it read, the Pope reminded the congregation in his chapel at St. Marta that the very first commandment, God gave man is to be fruitful and to multiply, stating that what it, it comes down to is that of selfishness, commenting that aging societies like Europe face a great demographic winter, and what is needed is more immigration. Without immigration, the Pope added, Europe will become empty, calling it a grave disease. Today, uh, Italy is experiencing that grave disease, which uh, has led to population decline for their, the fifth straight year. Uh, as they only have 67 births for every 100 deaths. In 2019, their deaths now exceed births by 212,000. So, what are the countries uh, doing to kind of turn around this demographic winter that they're experiencing? In May of 2017, while in Budapest, Hungary, speaking at the World Congress of Families 11, the Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, uh, in a speech to the delegates, he stated that their country had experienced a 10% reduction in populations their population over the last 10 years. Uh, experiencing, uh, and ex well, ex this reduction, he says, ca causes him great concern because he's concerned on how this is going to reflect on their economy. Stating that the Hungarian government was prepared to implement new and aggressive family policies, which would hope to encourage stronger and larger families. In this session, uh, in which uh, I spoke, I turned to the cabinet minister, 
sitting with me on the stand and told him that we had been working to coin the word demographic winter as a way to really strengthen and fortify the family uh, worldwide and that uh, other countries were funding demographic winter as a government initiative uh, in a like manner that really the progressive left was kind of used global warming. In fact, they talked, used it for population control measures and to look at less carbon footprints to pollute Mother Earth. Following the World Congress in Budapest, Naomi, one of the organizers of the World Congress of Families who was with me uh, at this time on the stand when I talked to this minister, let me know uh, that their government had scheduled a demographic summit in which the minister uh, had stood up and announced that uh, there in Hungary, that they would be funding demographic winter as a government initiative. Now, let's step back in time or history, okay, to gain a little bit of an understanding on how this demographic dilemma came about. I mean, interwoven into the tapestry of human history, uh, as part of this fabric of academic thought in the 1800s was this idea that the world is getting overcrowded. Uh, Charles Dickens, uh, in the early 1800s, wrote his timeless story, The Christmas Carol, where Ebenezer Scrooge made uh, this statement, if you'd rather die, then let them do so, and uh, decrease the world's surplus population. The idea uh, this idea was made famous uh, by Thomas Malthus of that same era and time, an English economist who wrote and published in 1798 an essay entitled The Principles of Population, where he claimed that food production can't keep pace with population growth. This uh, scarcity mentality towards population growth was then handed down through the centuries to our day, as it was once again echoed by Paul Ehrlich, a Stanford professor who in 1968 uh, published a runaway best-selling book, The Population Bomb, where he stated that by the 1980s, hundreds of millions of people would starve to death due to the lack of resources to sustain continued population growth. In uh, that, uh, a lot of people were greatly concerned, but did that ever happen? No, it didn't. Uh, however, this unsustainability idea was accepted by many scholars and shared uh, over the last two decades to our schools and university students, making it very politically uh, incorrect for teachers or professors or even politicians to talk about the importance that continued growth uh, has as needed for the survival of the nation. Now, uh, we need to probably ask ourselves, you know, this question, is the world overpopulated? Uh, for perspective as to whether it is overpopulated, let me just share with you a hypothetical example. Let's assume that you could take the entire population of the world which is uh, just over 7 billion, and to give every man, woman, and child on the planet a quarter of an acre of ground. That would give a family of four an entire acre of, of ground to farm and to cultivate. You could place the entire population of the world in just one country in South America, uh, Brazil, leaving an eighth of Brazil in open space. Uh, that would leave all the rest of S South America and Central America uh, uninhabited. That leaves North America uninhabited. That leaves all of Europe, Africa, China, India, Russia, uh, and every other island uh, and continent of the world uh, totally uninhabited. And we say, you know, with what we understand of science and agricultural production, that we can't sustain ourselves uh, going for forward uh, on this planet. Now, a good example of uh, how policies uh, for the future has 
changed societies. And here we're talking to policymakers uh, because policies, as we know, has a powerful influence on the future of a nation. Now, after three generations, okay, China uh, had in place uh, the one child policy. Uh, this policy has led to what demographers refer, refer to as a four to one scenario, uh, which one child is left to support two parents that are going into retirement and full four seniors who are in retirement, leaving just one in the family to pull the wagon while six are at the retirement age and looking to ride. This is an economic model that is not sustainable, as we know. You know, especially going back to that same idea that the ideal is to really have 10 workers to support one person in retirement. Today, China is feeling the effects of this one child policy. Uh, in 2015, China's uh, economy took a huge turn as their companies stock started to plummet, losing over 38% of its value, a loss of $3.25 trillion. As uh, this huge demographic shift was taking place uh, in China, they started to realize that maybe the one child policy wasn't that good of an idea. And uh, with that, they started you know, to, to realize that maybe they should allow people to have a second child. Dr. Nicholas Everstad also pointed out that sex selective abortions is so widespread that it has distorted population composition of the entire planet. As shown in China, where there is over 55 million men that will not be able to get married because there's not enough women coming up through the ranks. So what implications does this have for the world? and uh, especially for China. And uh, so what of China's future? Uh, projections show that in 2030, a quarter of China's population will be over the age of 60. Uh, China's elderly population increased 13% in 2010 and 18% uh, in 2019. Uh, and by mid-century, they will have over 200 million workers uh, that goes into retirement. This loss of workers uh, will mean less government revenues, uh, increase in taxes, increase in debt, uh, uh, increase in uh, pensions that need to be paid out and health uh, care costs. What has been concerning for Beijing is uh, China's ability to compete in the global market, which has previously been possible due to their large, low cost, high yield workforce. And that's what they've been re really relying on. In 2014, I was in Moscow as part of the organizing committee for the World Congress on Families that was pl being planned there. But, uh, due to Crimea and uh, some things that took place there that was canceled. But Russia today is also experiencing similar declines in population. It is estimated today that if present trends continue, that Russia's population will shrink from 141 million to 100 million by 2050. Father Dmitri is shown here in the picture, uh, said Steve, if you want to take a couple weeks, I'll uh, jump on a train with you and we'll go across Russia and we'll stop at towns and villages across Russia that has been totally deserted. Russia would like uh, immigrants, but they're a more closed society. And so when they open their borders, there's not a lot, you know, that come. Uh, and, and they need increases, you know, to really man uh, their farms and their factories going forward. So how did Russia's decline in population happen? Russia was one of the first to legalize abortions in 1922. And as such, they were one of the first countries to experience population decline. 
even with these declines, uh, many of the policymakers really hadn't woken up to the fact that their deaths and abortions were at 4.1 million, while their live births were only at 1.9 million. So what can be done to reverse the chilling effects of this demographic winter? Russia is starting to wake up and really take a hard look at this. Uh, on this Russian brochure, it states, strengthening the family is key to overcoming demographic winter. Policymakers, uh, as they wanted to get the, the word out, they are talking to their own policymakers and saying, hey, what can we do to make you know, these changes? We need to have more fam family-friendly policies. Uh, Otherwise, we will continue down what we believe is the wrong road. And so they started implementing more family-friendly uh, policies because there are a lot of policies out there that are detrimental to children, to motherhood, to marriage, to faith and family. Uh, Father Dimitri went on to uh, share the words of Prime Minister Putin who after coming to an understanding of the severity of the Russian situation stated that falling po population poses a dire threat to their country's very existence, unquote. So what is Russia doing to turn this around? Well, as you see on this brochure, it's really interesting because in the center of this brochure is family. Uh, family is central in solving the social ills that uh, many governments are experiencing worldwide. When policymakers come to understand the important role that children, marriage, and even faith play, uh, then they uh, implement and put together uh, policies that look, work to strengthen and fortify the family. And what they did to kind of kick this off is that they had a demographic summit. Uh, and as part of this Democrat demographic summit that they had at the University of Moscow, they put together policies. And the policies that came out of that summit uh, resulted in the passing of many new uh, incentives in support of the family, such as a government paid six month maternity leave a cash payment equivalent to 7,000 euros given to a family on the child's third birthday. We want to make sure that child gets to the third birthday. A monthly subsidy of food and uh, daycare. Uh, upon a family having a third child, they would be entitled to land ownership, be given a farm or uh, priority housing and rent subsidies. They also placed a syntax on performing abortions uh, and on one having, uh, on those having abortions and those performing ab abortions, uh, along with having a major restrictions on abortions after 12 weeks. When po policy makers start connecting the dots and seeing the big picture of what's happening in their own economy, they start to look at policy and what they can do to uh, strengthen and fortify the family. Now, another changing demographic that needs to be un understood by policymakers is that young adults from around the world in their prime childbearing years are less likely to get married and have children. Research shows statistically that there is an increased number of babies being born outside wedlock. With the findings showing that children being born, reared without a mother and father in the home are more likely to try drugs, to live in poverty, to be abused, to be sexually active, to drop out of school, uh, to need day care and uh, government welfare services showing that family fragmentation comes at a huge cost to governments worldwide, which raises the question, if having both a mother and, the, and a father in the home is the ideal, 
then shouldn't we as a society be reaching for that ideal? Shouldn't it be on the docket for discussion? Given that uh, strong families are really needed for a prosperous state. Let me share with you this little clip from our documentary, The New Economic Reality Demographic Winter, uh, which asks, you know, what is the solution? Uh, for, is it strengthening the family? That throughout history, the family has been the fundamental unit of society. It was within newly formed families that a majority of men and women met their most basic needs. It was within families that the next generation was born and raised. Groups of families became cultures and combined cultures became civilizations. And human civilizations were sustainable because at their foundations were families which could replenish themselves as older generations passed away. But what if, at the very time that our entire civilization no longer values families, we begin to realize how important and what if the traditions about families were correct? The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the first statement ever issued by the United Nations. It's a document that was signed by uh, all the countries in the world essentially at that time. And it was, it was non-controversial. The see it, it says the following. Family is a natural, fundamental group in our society that is entitled to protection by the state. In 1948, families were seen as so fundamental to society that major nations of the world vowed to protect them. But by 1968, many of us had begun to assume that there would always be plenty of others. In fact, too many others willing to marry and to bear and raise children. But were too many children born? So what is the economic solution? Uh, are we doing what we need to do to maybe turn around this demographic win winter with all its chilling effects? Uh, a defining event uh, in my life that inspired my own personal research looking at demographics worldwide was in uh, 1999. Uh, I was attending the World Congress on Families, which was held at the United Nations Assembly Hall uh, there in Switzerland, where in attendance, you know, we had about 3,200 delegates from 64 different countries that came together to del deliberate on the fate of the family worldwide. At that World Congress, uh, we were working on a declaration for the family, very similar to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Family Proclamation, an incre incredibly strong statement for the family. The goal was to have a unanimous consensus uh, on this family declaration of the world to be presented there at the United Nations and to be shared with nations worldwide. After several sessions, the debate, uh, looked like that it wasn't going to go any place, that we wouldn't get a consensus on this family declaration uh, to the world. Uh, it really looked doomed. When uh, Dr. Lappin, a Jewish rabbi, who had just, had just finished uh, addressing the delegation, stepped back up to the pulpit, uh, Rabbi Lappin, upon step stepping up to the pulpit, he said, I would like to invite the Arab delegation to come and join me on the stand. And so the Arab 
their delegation got up and walked to the stand with their big white robes, you know, from, the, from their head to the, to the floor. And they circled this uh, Jewish rabbi at the pulpit. And, uh, and he says, there isn't a lot of things in this world that the Jewish people and the Arab nations uh, agree upon. But when it comes to the importance of family and the value and blessing that children, marriage, motherhood, and family uh, play for the future of society, this is something that we honestly believe that we can come together on. And we would like the rest of you to come together with us on this. And with that, they grabbed their hands like this and they raised them in, in the air. And uh, Rabbi Lappin st stood up to the pulpit again and he says, we demand a vote. <laughs> and we want you to vote now for this uh, family declaration to be shared with the world. And a vote was taken and uh, a unanimous consensus was given. And, uh, and then they all walked out to see a beautiful firework show and see the Osman family performing uh, over uh, on the balconies there overlooking uh, Lake Geneva. Truly the family is the most fundamental unit of society and is worthy of protection by the state. Now in closing, uh, I would like to just share with you uh, this other short uh, video clip from our latest documentary, Outcomes, the Family and Faith Factors, in which we interviewed uh, nine uh, scholars who had really studied this and put together some compelling research that shows the vital role that marriage and faith and family play in the development of a child and ultimately in the, devel the development of a nation showing that if you want the highest outcomes possible for a child, then if you add a spiritual element to that equation, they, the findings show that if a child receives formal spiritual instruction on a weekly basis, that it will elevate a child to a whole higher, higher level of competency, showing the powerful influence that faith and family structure play in a development of the child, and like I said, ultimately in the development of a nation. And that having third party influences in that spiritual instruction is also uh, something that's very important that needs to be considered. So let me share you this little clip from that documentary. strength of the family is the strength of faith. I think that the principal force undergirding the family in society is faith. It's faith that validates the family. It's faith that teaches people the importance of putting others before self. Well, we look at the international data. Women who worship God weekly are the most fertile women in the world. Most more likely to have children. And those who never worship, who only have about 30, one third the number of children on average. It's faith that teaches the children and adults of our responsibilities to society, our responsibilities to past generations and our responsibilities uh, to future generations and our responsibility to our power long before the Ten Commandments. Before the patriarchs and the prophets, God spoke to his unique creations, Adam and Eve, and said, Go forth, multiply, replenish the earth. The first commandment is procreation. I've often said, well, it's a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, every measure 
measured within the U.S. federal survey system for adults and children. They thrive most in the intact married family of the worship of God. We okay, let's unpack that because it's a bit. The U.S. federal survey system is a huge boon to all of mankind because it's the only country in the world where we have lots of surveys. We have 14 federal surveys that analyze both the family structure and the frequency of religious worship. And it's as a result of that, we can see natural law playing out. We're looking now at the combined scores of math and English for American children and between grades 7 to 12. And this is one of the first pieces of data I saw of the impact of religious worship on education performance. And the first time I graphed it, I almost fell off my chair because it was one of the first impacts I'd seen in, the, in my history of the data really showing this. And here you see it. American kids, this is a picture of America, of American teenagers. Those who worship weekly are the ones who are doing best on average. A couple of times a month, a couple of times a year, never, just like that. The impact of this in education is phenomenal. It is the great unknown in education. It's the great suppressed data in education. Every teacher, every school principal, every college president, every secretary of education at the state level and at the federal level should be deeply imbued with this data. Think of an inner city welfare mother. Life is tough for her. The neighborhood isn't great. Schools are not that great. But if she brings her children, she and her children go to church each Sunday. The impact on her children are the same as if she had the capacity to move the whole family into a middle class neighborhood, middle class home, and going to one of those good middle class schools where the parents of the education system are taking care of. That's the impact of her bringing her poor children to church each Sunday. The family provides uh, many things for a nation. I mean, first of all, it is the safety net for the most vulnerable of society, both the young and the old. And given that children really is the lifeblood and the human capital that's really needed for every nation's continued growth and economic prosperity, and given that uh, the family uh, is probably that base, best safety net, uh, and that when you have family fragmentation, that it comes at a huge cost to the state, shouldn't we be looking to what can be done to elevate the value that we place on children, marriage, motherhood, and, and family and society? Uh, why? Because uh, families really do matter. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, that was really wonderful. And so uh, I will now open ourselves up to question and answer. Uh, the way that we'll do this is if you can use your chat function, which is in the bottom of your screen for everyone who's an attendee, uh, that will send the question, uh, your question to me. I will then uh, word it to Steve. Um, I had meant to mention that at the very beginning uh, of, of my introduction, but I probably unconsciously did that intentionally because I get to take uh, moderator's privilege and, and ask a question to start us off. Um, and so I had a, the pleasure of really getting to talk with Steve a little bit about this last week, uh, his presentation and how we, we kind of envisioned it. And so uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about over the weekend and, and again through this presentation uh, that you mentioned briefly that I'd love to hear a little bit more about is, is where you see the role of, of immigration and migration in this aspect of, of kind of the economic burden that's coming about with this low birth rate, right? Because a number of countries have seen uh, the opportunities that have, uh, are, uh, apparent when you have immigration, uh, but there are also costs to in immigration to countries. 
And so thinking about it from this economic perspective, what role do you see immigration and migration taking in a possible uh, answer or part of the solution, at least, to this demographic winter? Well, every developed country around the world really needs to take a new look at their immigration policy. Because uh, if they do not open their doors a little bit more wide and allow uh, immigrants, uh, they're going to be experiencing you know, some of the declines that are being experienced in a number of countries like Japan and Russia and Hungary and uh, almost of Eastern U Europe. And really, Europe of tomorrow, uh, we're seeing you know, a lot of change. And you've even uh, talked about you know, the cultural change that takes place within a country. And I think everybody really understands that, you know, at the, the way that things are changing, that the Europe tomorrow will be probably more Asian, African, and, and Muslim. And, and you have some great, you know, uh, benefits in having a mixed culture. Uh, I think they bring a lot of things to the, to the table, you know, to, the prosperous, to a prosperous nation. But on the other hand, it does change your culture. And, and that's what uh, many are concerned about, is uh, they are seeing some major cultural changes. Great, thank you so much. So uh, uh, my fellow panelist, uh, Ryan, uh, had, uh, had asked um, that in some ways this uh, demographic winter could be thought of as, as a potential chicken and an egg and the egg problem right, is, is the economy shrinking and that's causing families to have less children or are people having less children and that's leading to the cause of a declining economy or is it, you know, it could be a bi-directional aspect. And I think couched within this question um, is the idea of, of kind of the change uh, through time of what a family uh, can kind of sustain themselves on, right? In the 1960s in the US, uh, it was possible for a one family income uh, with that income being, you know, from a trade profession or something like that, to be able to support a rather large family if that family desired it. Whereas today, that may be a much more challenging proposition. And so where do you see this balance of addressing this demographic winter of this chicken and an egg, right? Is it the economy that's causing less family size and birth rate? Or is it the birth rate that's really driving this decrease in economic prosperity for nations? Well, as we look around the world, it really is amazing that it's the rich countries of the world that are seeing some of the greatest uh, fertility declines. So if it was an economic, you know, direct connection, uh, that probably wouldn't be, you know, the, the case. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, providing workers for, for the future for these uh, countries that need still, still man their farms and their factories, and some of them even thinking maybe for an army for the future, uh, they are looking to some of these uh, less developed countries around the world and really taking their men or their working age adults, okay, that need to be there to take care of their old and the young of their society, leaving their uh, countries very vulnerable, okay, because they are going to where, you know, the demand and the work opportunities are. And so what we're doing to these uh, less developed uh, countries around, around the world is really sad uh, because uh, they're lo losing uh, their working uh, population that could really s s help to sustain their economy. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, so I know we've got some questions coming in. Um, I'm going to go back to one of my questions uh, <laughs> and, then, and then I'll turn it uh, kind of fully loose from our uh, great attendees. Um, and, and, you, and you know that you can answer your own questions. This can be a reciprocal. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, um, 
had mentioned to you and some of you, uh, our attendees know, I, I'm from Kentucky originally. Uh, I've, I spent some time in my graduate work in rural parts of Kentucky. Uh, and I also had the real pleasure and joy of living on a Native American reservation for about three years during my graduate school time. Um, and I was, I'm curious always, because in these two communities, these are communities that don't have a lot of economic and educational opportunities. And one of the big problems often, especially on Native American reservations, is this brain drain. As, as we get more individuals in this community, those who want that economic prosperity see the only opportunity to be off the reservation, right? To leave often their culture behind as well. And so how does demographics kind of consider this idea of kind of work opportunities and social mobility within this idea of the need for a greater birth rate and greater population growth, how do we balance that with opportunity? Uh, let me step back uh, as you first talked about uh, the Native American populations uh, here in North America and how they have been affected. In fact, their whole demographic picture. And we think, you know, well, uh, Christopher Columbus and others, you know, came to the shores and, and brought disease. But actually, even before that, uh, what you, they really experienced is, is that there was a lot of slave trade going on anciently, both north and south, and uh, even around the world. And that there was ships uh, very capable of navigating, you know, the oceans, uh, east and west. And so, you have uh, a lot of things that are playing in to you know the demographic picture of the native americans and how that whole culture in fact almost you know massive civilization of the ancient mound building cultures of the hopewell the dina and the mississippian cultures you know came grinding to a stop okay because of uh, dem demographics and the changes and so we can look back you know in history and really see uh, the important of really having policymakers and uh, leaders of countries really analyze what their future holds if they don't make uh, a turnabout, you know, with on their demographic picture. Uh, and I probably didn't even hardly touch what <laughs> the question. That's okay. I mean. They, uh you know, the, the issue of dem demographics and addressing, you know, the global economic uh, difficulties that face uh, a variety of countries is certainly not something that's going to touch on every single part of this issue. Yes. So I was just curious as to how that kind of aspect had been considered. Uh, so we have a great question from Shauna Ogden. Um, how do we message this to the youth? Uh, they are the future. So uh, they will be obviously affected by this demographic winter. What are some ways that we can educate the younger generation to, uh, to kind of embrace this message and start being the solution to this problem that's upcoming? Well, as they really look at uh, that there is a real economic uh, connection uh, between the, the loss of children and their future. I, I know that the senior population is starting to realize it because they're wondering who is going to pay uh, their senior entitlements going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you have the youth that are concerned that uh, am I gonna be carrying that huge burden uh, of uh, this senior population? Uh, they need to understand really how uh, economics work and that you have to have enough children being born in, in society uh, because that is an economic model that has been turned upside down. Uh, it's been totally ro rotated from uh, how you uh, see, see the role, you need uh, a lot more children to just take care of uh, one senior person that's looking for senior benefits uh, within a society. Great. Oops. Um, so, so the 
education okay. process is, is going to be really trying, you know, but it really starts, you know, with uh, getting uh, educators first to understand the important role. And then, uh, and then, and when they understand that with the disintegration of the natural family and the below replacement fertility rates and the aging population, that uh, they aren't going to have much of a future for their country, then they will uh, elevate the, the value that they place on children, marriage, faith, and family in society. Because that's what it's going to take to be able to uh, turn around the chilling effects of this demographic winter. Great. Yeah, that, really interesting. Uh, so, um, Ed asks uh, a question about uh, the role of technology in replacing the declining workforce. Uh, we certainly are seeing a number of jobs and positions uh, that are getting replaced by robots and by other technology. How do you see that as playing into this uh, upcoming demographic winter? Well, it is a absolutely a necessity <laughs> with the way uh, the population is playing out around the world. Uh, I mean, every country is going to see a workforce shortage. And so uh, if you don't have, you know, some advancements in technology, and I think we've made some great strides there, and probably the thing that has really even saved us for the last uh, 20 to 30 years has been the, adva the great advancements that have been made in technology. But how long, you know, will that uh, continue those advancements? Uh, you still need a working population and an age, okay, if you're going to look at the entire demographic picture. I mean, the policymakers, we need, as policymakers, we really need to connect those dots and see the big picture uh, is really how we're affecting uh, the world going forward. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, so... Uh, another question that we had is um, how do we go from the demographic winter to a demographic spring? So what are some policies that need to be promoted? Uh, and what does, a, what does the demographic spring look like uh, in comparison to where we are now? Like how do we know that, that these policies have been effective, that we're moving in the right direction? Um, and then the final kind of caveat to this is, is there a point where there needs to be, uh, you know, a, a steadying up, a leveling off, or should the, should the goal be to continuously grow this pop, our population? Yes. Some of the family-friendly policies that have been put in place are helping. And the baby bonuses that have been uh, experimented with in some places, you know, has uh, helped the situation, but it's still pretty early on, okay? And a lot of countries like Budapest, for example, they implemented uh, many uh, family-friendly policies, encouraging larger families and, uh, and trying to increase their fertility rates. Uh, but that, I guess, that is still out there. We, we don't ex exactly know, you know, the total effects of that, but if we don't do anything, okay, we do know the effects that that will have if we don't uh, elevate the value that we place on children and motherhood. Great. Um, so I will suggest maybe I know that often uh, we get to a point where uh, with technology, there may be uh, a, a kind of uh, max time that we're able to uh, kind of stay focused and be staring at a screen, which I'm fully <laughs> aware of. Um, so I, I think this is a great opportunity to, to kind of wrap up our session. Uh, Stephen, I just want to thank you again, how wonderful this has been. Uh, it's really made me think about an, an aspect of the family that I really haven't thought much about. I, I, as a psychologist, think much more kind of micro about 
families and children and grandparents and communities. Um, but really thinking about this from a more global macro perspective is a really interesting way that we should be thinking about how do we actually make meaningful change that will have global uh, kind of ramifications and benefits. Um, and when we focus too micro all the time, we may not, we may be missing out on a lot of really interesting opportunities. Um, and I, I just had a wonderful event uh, with the ambassador from Hungary, uh, where she was uh, expressing a number of their uh, policies that you spoke about as well today, that have been really family friendly and really big on promoting uh, how individuals can make a meaningful difference locally, which will then, uh, of course, become nationwide and global impacts. Um, and so this different way of thinking uh, has really been enlightening and I really uh, thank you uh, for all of that, uh, for this information. Um, one last thing though that I just saw a, a request, uh, are you able to direct any of our uh, attendees to any information that you have online, uh, where they can access the documentaries for instance, uh, your book, uh, and any upcoming projects that you have that you'd like us to know about? Uh, on YouTube, uh, we have, you just look, punch in demographic winter. Uh, there are a lot of different clips from these documentaries. In fact, you can see a number of these documentaries in its entirety. Uh, I would encourage that. I recently uh, shared a presentation to uh, at a <laughs> online <laughs> uh, and sh shared a similar pre presentation uh, covering some of these points that you could go to YouTube under S Stephen E. Smoot and uh, possibly watch some uh, watch that uh, presentation. But we also have a number of clips out there. That, uh, looking up demographics or demographic winter, you could probably find. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the last thing that I want to just mention to everyone, of course, thanking everyone for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are interested in becoming a member of the NGO Committee on the Family New York, you can go to ngofamilyny.org. Uh, this is where uh, we have our website. You can join and become a member on the website there. You also can contact any of the executive board with questions uh, or comments or recommendations for future events. Uh, again, thank you so much, Steve, for joining Thanks. us and for this great presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending and for joining us. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you all for a terrific a uh, year of meetings for the NGO Committee on the Family New York, and we'll look forward to seeing you all again, I hope, in September. All right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. And thank you again, Steve, for me too. Okay. <laughs>